This is the National Broadcasting Company. Hey everyone, I'm Simone, and coming up tonight on Signal, the 116th Congress was sworn in today, and it's the most diverse in U.S. history. What can we expect from this new class of lawmakers as they arrive in a gridlocked Washington? And after Amazon announced it would open HQ2 in New York, protests broke out. And the outcry seemed like it was all grassroots and everything, but there was an organizing group involved. And it's the same one that helped elect Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And finally, whether you set a New Year's resolution or not, we're going to look at who's making them, what types of goals people set, and how long these things actually last. But first, midnight tonight will mark the end of two full weeks of this government shutdown. For 800,000 government employees, that means two weeks of not being allowed to work or two weeks working without pay. We spoke to one of those staff members, a career employee in the executive branch, who we're going to call Sally, about how she and her colleagues view the shutdown. Now, we agreed to conceal her identity because she's concerned about potential blowback when she can actually go back to work. So Democrats are blaming Republicans for this. Republicans are blaming Democrats for this. Who do you blame for this shutdown situation? Everyone I work with blames the president for this shutdown. It, it's really quite atrocious that they couldn't figure out a way to make this work. Um, funding the government is something that is so essential and so important and so something that just happens in the regular course of business. If you're a business, you have to figure out how to run your business appropriately. And the fact that we would allow um, people to shut down the government as a way to push policy change is really inefficient, ineffective, and really terrible for our country. You're furloughed right now, but what does that look like practically? So I'm one of the um, 380,000 uh, furloughed federal employees. What it means is that I am not legally allowed to work. I can't check my email. I can't take phone calls. And I'm not guaranteed that I will be paid. Um, my workload doesn't change. So uh, I have to either complete the work that I need to do before the shutdown, or I will need to complete it when I get back to the office, um, hopefully in the very near future. But the situation is different for some other governments government employees like TSA officers, right? Yeah, so there is about 420,000 federal employees that are currently working without guaranteed of getting paid. Um, many of these employees work um, in public safety, um, including in border security. Many of these employees, like many Americans, um, they are living paycheck to paycheck or with very little savings. Um, and so they will be very impacted by the fact that they are not guaranteed pay for the work that they're doing. When you worked under the Obama administration, there was a shutdown uh, over Obamacare. How is this shutdown different? So I will say that all shutdowns are bad. They are a waste of time. They're a waste of resources. I had to spend a ton of time preparing for this shutdown. I had to spend even more time preparing for the Obama shutdown. Um, this shutdown feels different to me um, because it seems as though it's going to last perhaps a lot longer. And uh, this shutdown feels like this $5 billion for a wall um, is, is more important than people who are actually currently working to protect the border. Um, so it actually feels a lot worse than past shutdowns. Is there a sense among you and your colleagues that shutdowns are becoming normalized? Yes, um, I think that there's definitely a view that shutdowns are becoming normalized as a way to push policy decisions. And I think it just shows how dysfunctional our government has really become. The fact that we have to have shutdowns in order to, to make our policymakers talk to one another is, is really disappointing. Now, in order for the government to reopen, Congress and the president have to reach a deal. As of today, Democrats control the House, and Speaker-elect Pelosi says money for the wall is a non-starter. President Trump, however, is holding firm on his demands. Here's what he had to say earlier today in his first-ever White House press briefing. I have never had so much support as I have in the last week over my stance for border security, for border control, and for, frankly, the wall or the barrier. I have never had anything like it in terms of calls coming in, in terms of people writing in and tweeting and doing whatever they have to do. I've never had this much support. And we've done some things that, as you know, have been very popular. 
So what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? For that physics lesson, we're going to go to Hallie Jackson, who's in D.C., where it's been, I don't know, just a bit busy today. Hallie, yeah. is there just a little bit, right? I don't know that there are any slow days anymore for you guys, but is there any hope for this shutdown to end anytime soon? So it depends on your definition of soon, Simone. If by soon you mean tonight or tomorrow, probably not. You asked about what happens when this immovable force meets an unstoppable one. Nothing. And that's where we are right now. Uh, Democrats, actually, as we speak, are getting ready to put something on the floor of the House of Representatives that would basically try to reopen government, right? So the House Democrats are like, we're going to do this. We're going to put this forward. We're going to try to open government. The Senate has already said that's not going to fly with them. And President Trump tonight with the White House has officially notified the House they're not going to sign it anyway. So no matter what happens tonight, the House is expected to pass this move. But we're just back to square one tomorrow morning. Now, let me tell you something that might end up changing the game here at the White House. And that is this meeting tomorrow morning. Nancy Pelosi, her number two, Steny Hoyer on the Democratic side are expected to come over here and to have a meeting with President Trump. Now, you might be going, wait a second. Didn't they just come over and have a meeting on Wednesday? Yes. And didn't that meeting go nowhere? Yes. That meeting went around in circles. The difference is the president at the end of that discussion said, hey, let's come back after the leadership elections, which happened today, and maybe we'll make some progress. So perhaps if you're an optimist, you're looking at this meeting tomorrow morning going, hey, maybe like the, the person you just talked to who's a furloughed government worker, they're going, maybe these sides can come to some kind of a compromise tomorrow, or at least try to figure it out. But I'll tell you what, right now, at least from the posturing piece of it, the president is is very firm on his position. He wants this money for a wall. Democrats are very firm on their position. They want no money for a wall. They want to do something on border security, but no wall. And and right now we're still at the same place we were, frankly, 13 days ago. Tomorrow, by the way, at midnight, this shutdown has the dubious distinction of turning two weeks old. So that is not great news for a lot of those folks who are really stuck in the middle during this shutdown. Why do I have the feeling this won't be the last time we talk to you about this shutdown? Because Hallie. it won't be the last time we talk about this shutdown, Simone. <laughs> I, I think we're both right here. Hallie, thank you so much. All right, Amazon announced another Washington newcomer last month, HQ2. So ever since they decided on the homes for their shared second headquarters, one outside Washington and one in New York, there have been protests, especially for the location in Queens. NBC New York's Alexa Liotto spent some time with the people who are rallying against the tech giant. Ever since Amazon announced HQ2, Footage of protesters has been all over the internet. It seems like everyone hates Amazon. No Amazon! No way! No Amazon! But maybe that's only half the story. A recent poll shows 57% of New York City voters actually approve of Amazon coming to New York. Only 26% were against it. And in Queens, where HQ2 will be located, people actually approved of it even more. 60% were in favor. But not everyone who supports the new location supports the financial package. So who is rallying against Amazon? And are they gaining any ground? This is Susan King. She's a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Turns out the DSA has been all over HQ2. They're worried about rent hikes, unemployment, and corporate welfare. It's very crowded here. It's one of the densest zip codes in the city. There's not, like, a space to build up, really. They echo similar ideas to that of Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who represents part of Queens, which makes sense. Many DSA members worked on her campaign last year. What are these materials? Petition. A petition. Okay, so the residents will like hopefully sign the petition. Yeah, yeah. Some people were happy to take a flyer and sign the petition. And we're just handing out some information about how um, there's too much like at stake here um, when it comes to Amazon. Thanks very much. But there were a lot of people who didn't want to talk. Hello? We're just here talking to folks about the Amazon headquarters that they're trying to build in Long Island City. They're going to bring all these um, high salary tech executives. And the DSA is definitely facing an uphill battle. Amazon is everywhere. Oh, look, an Amazon Prime package. People rely on it. And while some in the neighborhood are definitely against the deal and what they see as unfair tax breaks, this neighbor couldn't help but use Amazon. He relies on it for his own livelihood. 
I have a small business. We sell well on Amazon. Yeah. It is a necessary evil. Right, yeah. Well, um, what is your I business? I don't love it. We sell uh, natural food. I have to sell through Amazon because that's where 50% of all product searches begin online. So I feel like the jobs that are coming here are not for people who need jobs. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that it's just going to be the people who work at Google already are going to. Yeah, that's going to be the small amount of people who work in the tech industry and then a bunch of transplants. Walking around with Susan and Aaron, I couldn't help but feel like Amazon was almost too big to be taken down. Was the door knocking really effective? And my biggest question, whether the Amazon deal can actually be reversed. It seems like the DSA is really saying, we're not asking for the Amazon deal to be renegotiated. We want it to be vetoed. Is that actually possible? The thing is, I've spoken to people, including elected officials, who tell me that it's a little bit unclear because there's um, quite a few legal gymnastics um, at play. I think that that's a talking point they're using to try to discourage political organizing. People don't understand just what's at stake in terms of their quality of life. What is at stake here? We want to point out to our fellow residents that there's so many things that we could do to protect New Yorkers and that the money that we have, like the billions of dollars that are going either as tax breaks or, or direct, um, I guess, money giveaways to Amazon should be spent on other things. We don't want um, New York City to become just a corporate playground in which our, our resources are going to the richest man in the world. So I wanted to check where the resources were actually going. For its part, Amazon says it has to invest in the neighborhood before getting any perks. I called New York City's deputy mayor, Alicia Glenn, who oversees housing and economic development. She played a major role in bringing Amazon to Queens. There's been a fair amount of concern over the financial incentives that New York is granting Amazon. What do you say to people who believe this is an unfair deal? So there's no special deal for Amazon, and I think that's really important for people to understand. We've had a long-standing policy of trying to encourage job growth in the outer boroughs, and again, this is an endorsement of that strategy. When we look at the benefit that we're going to get over the coming years, the billions of dollars in revenue that are going to be generated by having Amazon be part of our ecosystem, that's what people should be focusing on, because that's money. It's all the things that make New York City great. Can the Amazon deal be reversed? It's not an issue of whether or not the deal will be undone. It's a question as to over the course of the next 12 to 14 months, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for community input around some of the issues that are still open. But the basic framework of the deal um, is done, and we are going to be moving forward. So it doesn't sound like the deal is going to be reversed. But perhaps the door knocking can spark a little bit of change. Yeah, you'll knock 70 doors for three hours, and sometimes you'll talk to just like five or six people. And that's like kind of like the slow and steady way to building grassroots power. Well, the stock market isn't doing so hot. The Dow closed down almost 700 points today, and the Dow and the S&P 500 are on track for one of the worst starts to a year since the year 2000. And a lot of this actually has to do with Apple. So our friend Jason Snell is an Apple expert. He's, he's here to tell us what's going on. Jason, Apple is known to be pretty conservative in their earnings estimates. I mean, the last time that they actually had to lower expectations like this was in 2002. So what do you think happened? Yeah, in fact, they usually sandbag a little bit. They got a real reputation for undershooting for many years, although not the last couple. Um, you know, if you look at Tim Cook's statement, it sounds very much like China is the primary factor here, that there is something going on in the Chinese economy and it's not good. And you couple that with a lot of really tough competition for Apple in China from the uh, Chinese phone makers that do very well in China and are growing market share. But I think it's interesting that it, while saying that that was primarily what was going on here, Apple also gave a whole other list of things that might be going on, including the fact that their battery replacement program was very popular, which presumably led to a lot of people keeping their old iPhones with a new battery instead of buying a new iPhone. And I think that there's some question about broader softness on the iPhone, even though Apple says primarily this is about an iPhone shortfall in China. So talk to me a little bit about this direct correlation between Apple's growth and the Chinese economy. And then also, how do these rising trade tensions play into all this? Yeah, well, Apple has put a lot 
of effort into being in China. Apple, uh, Tim Cook has said on many occasions that they think China is a long-term play for Apple. They think that China has an enormous uh, potential growing middle class, a middle class the size of the entire U.S. population, and Apple thinks that that's their target audience. But the trade tensions, the fact that the Chinese economy may be stalling, those when your when your biggest bet for growth is China. And your biggest product is the iPhone, and it is more than 60% of Apple's business at this point. When you have a hiccup on your biggest product in your biggest uh, opportunity for growth, everybody on Wall Street who is not as concerned about the fact that Apple is immensely profitable and generates a lot of revenue as it is about growth, because that's what investing is all about, they start to freak out a little bit. And that's really what's going on here. If something goes wrong with the iPhone in China, it can hurt the entire business, even though, as Tim Cook said in his statement yesterday, uh, the rest of their business is up, like up a lot. So it's easy to look at all this coverage and think, gosh, Apple is doomed at this point. But it's worth remembering, like you mentioned, that the company is still expecting to make $84 billion in revenue this quarter. Well, I mean, it has a lot to do with what you're looking at. If you're looking at this from a Wall Street perspective, from an investment perspective, Wall Street really cares about growth. And so the question with the iPhone has always been, like, where are you going to grow iPhone? The last couple of years, the iPhone has basically flattened. You know, that that is that's just the truth of the smartphone market. The smartphone market is kind of flattened. And everybody who's looking at it from that perspective is saying, well, where's your next iPhone? And I think the truth is there's not going to be a new product category the size of the smartphone anytime soon. If you look at Apple from this other perspective, which is, how's it doing as a business? It's doing great. This quarter, this quarter that we're all talking about as being a disaster because it's going to be a few billion dollars less than they thought, will be Apple's second biggest quarter of all time. They are still one of the most profitable, successful companies in the world. Jason, and Snell, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. And now on to a few of today's headlines briefly. So we'll start in Moscow, where the Russian Interfax News Agency is reporting American Paul Whelan has been indicted for spying. Russia's FSB State Security Service detained Whelan last Friday, but didn't give any details about his alleged espionage activities. Now, this case, of course, comes on top of already tense diplomatic relations between Russia and the United States. American ambassador to Russia John Huntsman visited Whelan in prison yesterday. Yesterday. And Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the U.S. has asked Russia to explain the arrest and if it determines his detention is inappropriate, it will demand his immediate return. According to his lawyer, Whelan will probably be in custody in Moscow until at least February 28th, and he could ultimately face up to 20 years in prison if convicted. All right. Meanwhile, in Saudi Arabia, the 11 people suspected of killing Washington Post columnist J Jamal Khashoggi attended their first court hearing today. And according to Saudi state media, prosecutors will seek the death penalty for at least five of them. Now, Khashoggi, you remember, had long been critical of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman before he was killed in a Saudi consulate in Turkey in early October. Now, there are still a lot of questions we don't have answers to, like the names of the 11 suspects or what happened to his body or how this could have happened inside a Saudi consulate. And now for some news from the Catholic Church, where the Pope issued a stern message to U.S. bishops commanding they do something about the culture of sex abuse crimes and cover-ups. The Pope's strongly worded eight-page letter was specifically addressed to U.S. bishops who are currently gathered near Chicago for a meeting. And this letter, it told them to stop playing the victim or the scold and that the religion itself is at stake. Now, switching gears here, it was a big day for China's space program and Pink Floyd fans all around the globe as China made a major breakthrough by landing on the so-called dark side of the moon. Now, the U.S., the former Soviet Union, and China have all sent spacecrafts to the near side of the moon, which is the side that faces us, but this is the first ever landing on the other side. Now, the landing is a really big deal for China because its space program is relatively young, and this is a sign of China's growing ambitions to rival the U.S., Russia, and Europe, not just in space, but also geopolitically here on Earth. And those are your headlines briefly. We'll be right back in 30 seconds. The topics we cover on MSNBC every day, they're driven by big ideas, big themes, huge societal changes. And that's what we talk about on our new podcast. It's called Why Is This Happening? Why Is This Happening with Chris Hayes? New episodes every Tuesday. 
As the government shutdown grinds on, Nancy Pelosi joins Joy Reid for an exclusive town hall one day after being sworn in as House Speaker. How will her leadership impact the Trump presidency? The Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, tomorrow at 10 on MSNBC. Big day on the Hill with Nancy Pelosi being sworn in again as Speaker of the House. And it's also the first day of school for the new freshmen in Congress. So here's a quick rundown of the new kids. Now, you've probably already heard this, but there were a number of firsts this year. We've got the first Native American women in Congress and the youngest woman ever elected. That's Democratic standout Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and she's 29 years old. Now, we've also got the first Muslim women in Congress. One of those is Democrat Ilhan Omar of Minnesota. She wears a religious headscarf, and one of her party's first moves today changed the rule banning religious head coverings, so she'll be allowed to wear her hijab on the House floor. Now, take a look at the new class. A record 102 women will serve in the House and 25 in the Senate, so that's why people are calling this another year of the woman. But the 2018 Year of the Woman wasn't exactly a bipartisan phenomenon. A handful of Republican women broke down barriers in places like South Dakota, where Kristi Noem is the first female governor, and Tennessee, where Marsha Blackburn is the state's first female senator. But think about these numbers. Democrats elected 35 new women to the House compared with just one, just one for Republicans. Now, partly due to a wave of retirements, the share of Republican women in the House is actually down from last year, falling from 23 to just 13. There are some other interesting things to look out for with this group, though. For one, it has more military vets than any new class in the last 10 years, plus nine scientists with STEM backgrounds got sworn in today. So this new class looks different, and with that comes a lot of different ideas. Will that make it harder for the two parties to agree on a cohesive internal message? Look, no one knows how this is going to go, but it will be interesting to watch. All right, switching subjects here. Netflix began streaming in over 130 countries in 2017, but this week the company pulled an episode of one of its most popular late night shows from its platform in Saudi Arabia. We swung by to talk to NBC's tech editor, Jason Abruzzi's, about what happens when American companies have culture clashes overseas. <laughs> All right, so you might have heard recently that Netflix pulled down an episode of Hansam Minhaj's new show, Patriot Act, because one of the segments was critical of the leader of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. We're seeing examples around the world of pieces of entertainment that come out that make certain groups very, very angry. For instance, in Lebanon, Wonder Woman was pulled because Gal Gadot is the star. She's Israeli and was part of the Israeli Defense Force for a while, leading to severe backlash. We've also seen the rise of China as a major force in international entertainment. There's a lot of money there and there's a lot of people who are banking on appealing to Chinese people for a big part of their income. But appealing to Chinese people in the Chinese box office means also getting along with the Chinese government, which means abiding by certain censorship laws and cultural norms. We're seeing similar problems in places like India, where there's a lot of people who are starting to enter the middle class, starting to subscribe to streaming services, but it's also a country that has had a long history of censoring movies for certain types of content. Even companies like Disney and classic stories like Beauty and the Beast are starting to run into this problem. In Malaysia, the film was held from screening because it contained what censors called a gay moment. The movie did eventually hit screens, but with a PG-13 rating. Disney's launching an international streaming service this coming year. So is Warner Media from AT&T, which includes HBO's Game of Thrones, which I'm sure is going to run afoul of plenty of censorship issues. So just like Netflix, these companies are trying to appeal to an international audience. They need those subscribers, and they need to get along with the local governments. At the same time, there's going to be a lot of people watching to see how much censorship are these companies willing to tolerate and willing to put into the stuff that they're making. Now, we're only three days into 2019, but by now, you may have already given up on your New Year's resolution. That's okay. That's okay. You're not alone. Our friends over at NBC's Left Field explain. You failed at your resolutions, and we totally knew that was going to happen. So 
this is a graph which shows our interest in New Year's resolutions from the beginning of December to the end of January last year. And it's pretty much the same every year with a great big peak at the 1st of January. But it's round about this time of year where we start to break our resolutions. So even though we break them, the kind of resolutions we make, when we make them and when we break them, actually tells us a lot about ourselves as a society. Jesus, Owen, this thing's a beast. When it comes to New Year's resolutions, there's a lot of falling at the first hurdle. Mostly because a whole lot of you didn't even make them. And another 20% of you kind of don't care either way. And for the 40% of people in the US who do, congratulations, there's actually a long history of resolution making. Babylonians 4,000 years ago had a ritualized way of promising to return borrowed stuff. The Romans did something similar and changed the date of the first of the year to January. And since Christianity, making promises to deities has meant that resolutions have historically been religious. What did the US set as its goals for 2018? Saving money, losing weight, having more sex, um, traveling more, reading more, learning a new skill, buying a house, stopping smoking, and finding love. And what do they have in common? They're hilariously selfish. These days, our resolutions are less about God, and they're more about ourselves. And this correlates to the way we feel about religion. Okay, so there have been some ups and downs, but essentially there's been a general decline in our confidence in organized religion over the past four decades. And we've got a lot of other things we do to try and improve ourselves. There's been a rise in industries like self-help, plastic surgery, and the demand for everything to be customized. Okay, so people are hilariously optimistic about keeping their New Year's resolutions. But at the end of the day, for every 100 people who make them, Ultimately, only 9% of people are going to keep them. But despite the fact that we are really, and I mean really bad at keeping New Year's resolutions, the most irritating thing about them is the fact that studies have shown that if there's something you really want, purely by setting a goal makes you 10 times more likely to achieve it. And that's our show for tonight, everybody. Thanks for watching. We will see you next week. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.